Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Adobe Live. My name is Howard Pinsky, Senior Design Evangelist here at Adobe. Hope you're all doing well on this, what day is it? Wednesday. Wednesday morning, afternoon, or evening. If you are tuning in live here on Behance, let me know in the chat who you are and where you're tuning in from. We've got Frank and Robert and Jorge and Carol and CJ. Great to see all of you. Hope you're well. If you attended Adobe Max, was it last week or the week before? Time is weird. I don't know. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you soaked in all the exciting news and announcements. Some of them I'm going to be going over today. Hey, Oliver, great to see you as well. All right. So what are we going to be tackling today? Well, we're going to be diving into a little bit of photo composition in Photoshop using generative AI. I did deliver this session at Adobe Max whenever it was, two weeks ago, one week ago, something like that. Uh, this one was not available online because I took over a class from Julianne Cost. Um, so hers was available online, so definitely go check that out. But mine is not. So I figured we'll touch on some of the topics that I kind of explored during that session today. All right, let's go ahead and hop over to my screen. And before we dive into Photoshop on the desktop, I do want to showcase Photoshop on the web very quickly because we did release this publicly a few weeks ago, actually, uh, myself and Ashley still were at the code conference, which was really exciting. And we kind of unveiled this. It was, it's been in beta for a while, but it's a now officially available to the public. Uh, hey, Andrea and Marcy, great to see all of you. Oliver says, Max was the week before last. Yeah, see, I don't know time anymore. It's especially when you get home from a conference, you just rest for a while and then you just forget what time even is. All right. So photoshop.adobe.com, you can access Photoshop on the web from all of your different devices. Uh, works great on Chromebooks, which is wonderful. And a lot of the features that you're familiar with in Photoshop on the desktop are now available on the web, which is amazing. So let me just hop open this document for a second and they all sync with your desktop documents as well. We've also brought generative fill and generative expand to the web. So. You may have seen this demo. I, for some weird reason, I like removing dogs. But in this case, it's justified because this dog is a bit blurry. It's out of focus, right? So you want to remove the dog. So I'm going to go ahead and grab one of my selection tools. And you might notice in Photoshop on the web, we've grouped tools a little bit differently, but slightly more intelligently. So if you do like that kind of grouping, let us know. You can also, you know, do that manually in Photoshop on the desktop as well. But one thing I was, while I'm making this selection, one thing I talked to a lot of people about at Adobe Max is, especially new users, what do you want to see on Photoshop on the desktop to improve your experience? I would love to hear some comments in the chat. So I've gone ahead and made a selection around this out of focus dog. And then down at the bottom, we have our contextual taskbar on Photoshop on the web. I can go ahead and pop in there and then press generate. It's going to start that process of doing exactly what it does on Photoshop on the desktop now on the web, which is wonderful. In a few seconds, we should see some, you know, three different results for the removal of poor, whatever this dog's name is, right? So there's one, not bad. There's two, it added a pillow in there, which is great. This one's a lot better. He's kind of manspreading, which may not be what you want, but it, again, it added a pillow in there for him to rest his arm. It can kind of, Photoshop, I guess, detected a little bit of a pillow right there, right? So it just created the rest. So even if it wasn't a perfect generation, this one's pretty close. It probably got us like 80% of the way there and it just transformed this image, which is wonderful. All right, so enough of Photoshop on the desktop, I mean the web. We'll probably do another stream on the web in specific. But one more thing I want to show off that kind of snuck under the radar at Adobe Max, especially for you Lightroom users, is we added lens blur to Lightroom. So what does that mean? Well, you may have taken a photo, whether it's on your phone or on your camera, and the f-stop was like f16 or 22 or whatever. So you don't have a lot of blur in the background, right? I went golfing last week, I think. Again, time is weird, I don't understand it. Um, went golfing, took a selfie, because that's what you do, I suppose. And I wanna blur the background a little bit more. So in Lightroom, either on the desktop or on your phone, you can find lens blur, which is down here at the bottom. I can go ahead and apply that. And it uses AI to generate and figure out the depth, right? So you don't have to take a portrait photo or a shallow depth of field photo, which is wonderful, right? 
So I can adjust the amount of blur. I can make it really blurry if I want, or just a little bit blurry. We can also control the different bokeh. Bokeh, bake, bokeh, however you pronounce it. Uh, so you have all these different options here. You can also adjust the focal range. So if you wanted more of the foreground uh, in focus, you can kind of pull that or you know, out of focus, I should say, or if you wanted, let's say maybe the golf bag in the background, right? So if you take a look here, my scraggly beard, right? So here it's a little bit out of focus and here it's more in focus. So you can very easily kind of pull this slider right over here to the right, but you can take it even a step further. You can visualize the depth, right? So if you wanted somewhere around here, but then you want to add in manually the, bag, uh, the golf clubs in the background, you can turn visualize depth on. It's gonna show you what's in focus is kind of in yellow. What's out of focus is a lot darker. So what we're able to do is we can choose what we want to brush in, focus or blur. So I wanna maybe brush in focus, right? And I can control the brush size, all this fun stuff. Maybe I'll lower the brush size. And I can literally just paint in what I want to be in focus. It's a terrible job, but I, when I turn that off, you're gonna notice it's now in focus. So it's mind blowing, right? Here's one more ex very quick example. This was actually generated using Adobe Firefly. So I can turn on lens blur. It's gonna estimate the depth of field and give you this really nice effect in the background. You can blur it quite a bit if you wanted to. And look at that bokeh back there, right? You have all these different options. It's just fancy. All right. Marcy saying, part of what amazed me about generative fill is that all of you who present have to go live not knowing what the results... Mar uh, Marcy, you have no idea. Sometimes you get results, I and mean, it's gotten better, but sometimes like 17 arms pop up on the thing you're generating. And sometimes it just doesn't go through if the Wi-Fi is not working. It's a lot of fun, uh, but that's what makes my job enjoyable. All right, let's go ahead and hop over to Photoshop on the desktop because that's what all of you are here for. I do want to showcase a few things that I demoed at Adobe Max, specifically around photo composition. So the first thing, and some of you may have seen this already, is extending images in Photoshop using generative fill and generative expand. So we have this image here, wonderful image from Adobe Stock. I might want it to be a little bit larger. Oliver's saying only 17 arms. It's gotten better. So now, now we're down to 16. Uh, all, no, honestly, Firefly 2, if you haven't used that yet, um, firefly.adobe.com, mind-blowing stuff. And hopefully soon that will come over to Photoshop. So, you, so generative fill and generative expand will be astronomically better. So stay tuned for that. So the first method I want to showcase is generative expand in Photoshop. Really simple stuff, right? So if I go ahead and zoom out and grab my crop tool, shortcut key C, I might want to expand this out maybe in both directions, right? Now, previously you can expand it just transparent. So you just have some transparent sections on the side or content aware fill. Let's tr start with that. And in this example, it probably won't be too bad. It's not bad, but what content aware fill, content aware fill is doing is it's really kind of grabbing existing areas of the image and kind of pasting them almost, it's almost like copy paste, right? So you can kind of see that this tree here probably exists somewhere else. You have part of this fence that it just plopped in there. I don't know what's going on over here and on this side here. So content aware fill definitely works for some cases, right? But for this, it's probably not gonna do. So I'm gonna undo that. And this time we're gonna use generative expand. So if I'm gonna enlarge this a little bit, Go up to the top, we can do generative expand either on the options bar or down at the bottom on your contextual taskbar. And I'm gonna press generate. Now, instead of simply copying and pasting elements from the existing image into the transparent missing areas, it's literally regenerating new areas. I forget what the word is that our engineers use, um, but it's just creating the stuff that didn't exist. And they give it three different options, right? And like I mentioned before, once Firefly 2 finds its way into Photoshop on the desktop, these images and these generations will be higher quality and higher resolution. So hopefully that shows up sooner rather than later. But, you know, this tree does not exist anywhere else in the photo. So it's not copying and pasting. It's got done a much better job at reconstructing what was outside of those bounds that didn't exist before. Now, there is another way you can extend an image using Photoshop. And I want to show you that because this is kind of fun. So I'm going to hop over to Finder and I do have a bunch more images from Adobe Stock that I licensed. And by the way, if you don't have images you want to use in your 
photo composition workflows, if you do go over to Adobe Stock, stock.adobe.com, there is a completely free section. So if you want landscapes, for example, landscape, right? In terms of landscapes, we have 69,983 results, which is great. And all of these are available for commercial use. So you can license them, knock yourself out, have some fun with them. Obviously we've licensed quite a few of them, um, but it's great that there's a free section on Adobe stock, which is available to all of you to use. So back to Finder, let's find another image that sort of might blend with this one, but also may not blend. Let's see, this one's not too bad. I'm kind of looking for on the side, something that would maybe connect with either the trees on the left or the right. So maybe this one over here, right? We've got some trees on this side. This one could work. So I'm gonna drag this image into Photoshop. Boop, there we go. I can accept that. Now, obviously we want to somehow connect the trees over here with the trees over here, right? So maybe the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip this particular layer. So under the edit menu, down to transform and then flip horizontal, right? Now I wanna move this over on this side. Now, obviously, can't see much of it, right? So I'm gonna just kind of shift it over to the edge. Now I can either use my crop tool and extend this outwards, making sure I don't use generative expand in this situation. Or what I can do is I can go up to the image menu and then reveal all. There we go. So it now showed everything that I kind of want to use for this particular blend, right? I do want probably a little bit more space in between these two images. So I'm gonna shift this over a little bit. I could, if I want to reveal all one more time. And now I have this big block in the center and I'm gonna use this to blend the two images together. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna grab our rectangular marquee tool or any other selection method that you might want, but I think the rectangular marquee tool works well. And instead of simply selecting just this area here, I wanna select a little bit more. And I can hold down my space bar to move this around and we'll do something like you know what maybe we'll select a little bit more just to give photoshop a touch more room something like that right so right now we have a selection that contains a little bit of the left image a little bit of the right image and that block in the middle and what we want to do now is want to go to generative fill within our contextual taskbar and press generate unless you had something very specific that you want to fill this area in but i want to give photoshop the wheel let it do its thing and figure out how to blend these two images together, right? These trees are very different. We've got some dark orange and red trees on the left, bright green trees. Wow. And there you go. I'm always blown away by, and it's only gonna get better. This one's pretty good. It's only gonna get better once Firefly 2 makes its way into Photoshop on the desktop. These results, even though they're great now, they're continuously gonna get better, right? So it's figured out how to blend in. And it didn't just make up like a gradient blend from the left image to the right image, it literally created this transition of trees where some of the orange trees are kind of mingling with the green tree. It's weird. This technology is weird these days, isn't it? So now we have this image that blends really nicely together. And even the sky, and you can see a little bit of a line here, especially if you zoom out. What that is, sometimes the layer mask down here is creating a little bit of a harsher line. Sometimes you can just disable it. So you can hold down your shift key and click on it. Or if you just want to get rid of it, delete the layer mask. And there we go. Robert's saying not what I expected. I wasn't expecting that either, but I'm kind of liking it. I think it worked. I mean, this one's kind of cool too. I don't know. We'll stick with this one. Now, one more thing I might want to do to this image is change the sky. The sky is not bad. It blended it quite well, but we might want something maybe a little bit warmer possibly. Um, so what we can do, and you know what, honestly, I'm probably not going to use this entire image. So I'm actually going to go back now that I've showed you how to use uh, generative fill to expand your extend your images, right? Let's actually just go back and focus on this image here. So I might want to change the sky. The blue sky is great, but I might want maybe a, a warmer, maybe a sunset, something like that, right? So we could use generative fill, but we're going to save that for a moment. Under the edit menu, we're gonna go down to sky replacement. And this kind of uses AI, but not the new fancy AI that we're all using for our generative technologies, right? Um, so you're gonna notice something once I start selecting some of these skies. So this one, 
Ooh, that one's kind of fancy, right? So if I turn this off and then back on, you're noticing a few things, right? Obviously the sky has changed, but if you look closely, especially in this area here, the foreground color is changing as well, right? And that's because we have these options down here at the bottom to control our foreground lighting. So we can increase our foreground lighting here, which is really gonna affect this area that kind of connects with the sky. Whoops, wrong one, right? I think I definitely want it on the right side. We have edge lighting, kind of the same thing. And then we have color adjustment. So if your foreground is a little bit on the cooler side, right? You might want to increase this quite a bit so that everything warms up. Now, obviously we want to strike a balance because this looks like a nuclear apocalypse. So we might want to just bring this back just a little bit somewhere in this range here. You can also adjust the sky itself. So if you want it a bit more brighter, maybe less warm, right? You can definitely adjust the temperature. And then if it's not connecting well with either the trees or the mountains, you can shift the edge and then fade the edge if you want as well. Because what you might notice is that in some photos, especially where the sky is much brighter towards the mountains or the sky, you know, this area here is gonna be blown out. So fading the edge can, will help kind of fade and blend the new sky with the old foreground. CJ is asking the question I'm just about to get to. Is it possible to replace the sky reflection to match? So within sky replacement, no, because like I mentioned, this is using old AI technology and it's just not that smart, right? Um, so the answer, once I fade this to my liking, I can tweak this forever. The answer is within here, no, right? So what we're gonna do is we are going to output this result to new layers. And what that's gonna allow us to do is it's gonna give us a whole group of all the adjustments that it used for the sky and also the color adjustments for the foreground, right? Which is great. But we still have that old sky in the reflection down at the bottom. Certainly don't want that, right? So there are a few ways we can do this. The first way is we can experiment with generative fill. So what, what I'm gonna do to start is I'm going, hey, General Kenobi, I'm going to grab the bottom layer because when you wanna make a selection of something, you wanna select the layer that you're selecting, right? So the background layer, and I wanna select the sky. So I'm gonna grab my, let's try the object selection tool and I'm gonna simply make a selection. I'm gonna drag a selection around this area here and Okay, it did a pretty good job. It selected most of the sky, excluded the trees, which is exactly what we want, right? If we wanted to, we can also grab something like the quick selection tool and exclude the mountains just by brushing over top of it. There we go. All right, we have like 7,000 different selection methods in Photoshop and all of them are useful for some reason, which is mind blowing, which is great. All right, so we have now the sky reflection selected. Now we wanna make sure that if we did output this as separate layers in this group here, right? We wanna make sure that we're on top of the group. Otherwise, it's not gonna detect the sky. And what's really cool about generative fill is it's not just looking in the vicinity of your selection. It's looking at the entire image. It's understanding the image. So it's going to hopefully understand that there's a new sky in, the sky, right? So I'm gonna go to generative fill and let's just give Photoshop the wheel again and see what happens. Sometimes you might have to type in something like lake, reflection, something of that nature, but let's find out. Going back to Marcy's point earlier. Okay. And this kind of shows, you know, highlights what I was telling you about. It's understanding what's happening in the entire image. So it understood that there's a new sky up there. And it understood that we selected water and there's a reflection and the reflection isn't perfect. And it just created a new reflection for us before, after. That's just wild, right? And then from here, you can go ahead and experiment with different blend modes maybe if, if you wanna blend it a little bit more with the original layer underneath it, right? Or you can simply just drop the opacity a little bit so it's not too harsh or apply adjustment layers, all sorts of, interesting things that you can use to, you know, fix your reflection if it's not perfect. Another way you can do that if you don't want to use, um, hey, gener uh, 
I already said hi, but he said, this is Pinsky material. It's gold. So was the sky. Terrible joke. All right. Another way um, you can, hey, Jack, great to see you. Another way you can, you can use the outputted layers to create the reflection. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the old sky, which is this one here. Now, what you might notice is that when you first output it, it's output with the layer mask unlinked. So first we want to link it together. Otherwise, when we duplicate it and move it, it's going to be all over the place. Second, we want to duplicate it. So I'm going to hold down my alter option key, drag this up to the top. And now I have a separate sky layer. So we have one here and then one over right over there, right? But you're also going to notice that there's a link over to the right. So if I move this around, it's going to grab the old sky as well and move that around as well, which we don't want, right? So I'm going to right click and then unlink layer. It's always difficult to find exactly what you're looking for when you're streaming and there's a long list of stuff here. Unlink layers. There we go. So now what we can do is we can move this sky separate from the original, right? So I can go at edit, transform, and then flip vertical. Now, of course, it's not going to be, it'll, it's close, right? Because the reflection is almost there, but the angle is probably a little bit off. So what we can do is we can either edit the current layer mask or we can delete the layer mask, right? And then now that we have it kind of close, we can use a selection like we did before. So I'm just going to copy the selection from this layer and pop it over there. And then we can use blend modes and all sorts of different things like I showed you earlier to kind of get it in that vicinity, right? But honestly, the general, a uh, general, general Kenobi's in the chat, um, the generative fill, you can just call it general fill. The generative fill example worked quite well. So I'm going to stick with that and we're going to move on to the next topic. So we've changed the sky. We've added a reflection, kind of tweak the colors a little bit. Things are looking good. Now, what we want, might want to do is maybe add a tree in this area here. Right. So I over in Finder, I do have some trees and I have this nice dead tree. Why not? We're going to add a dead tree in the center of our post apocalyptic world. Right. So maybe somewhere right about here, we've got this lovely tree. I mean, many of these trees we can probably this one's not bad either. You know, let's let's go for this one. Make it a little bit more difficult with a non solid background. Right. So we're going to place our tree somewhere in this area here. Now, I do want to showcase something that I found very interesting lately. Is the various selection methods in Photoshop, like I mentioned earlier, are very good for specific things. But also, they differ a lot, uh, especially when you're removing the background. So this background here is fairly simple, right? But you're noticing that we've got some very intricate branches and things going on around it. So removing the background is not necessarily easy. Now you might think right down to the bottom, we've got this remove background button on their contextual taskbar. You also have it. If I select, uh, usually it's in the, uh, maybe it's just now on the contextual taskbar. Usually it was in the properties inspector or the properties panel. So I can go ahead and press remove background and you're going to notice uh, it did an okay job sort of. If I'm lying to myself, um, but yeah, it's not, it's not the best right now. We also have select subject, so we can press select subject. It's going to detect most of the tree, right? And then we can apply a layer mask. It essentially gave us the same output. So what's the solution? Well, the solution for the most part is actually to use another selection method. Now, someone recently on Twitter asked why, like why? Why doesn't remove background work as well as what I'm about to show you? It's a very good question. I don't know, but hopefully that will change in the future. But I'm going to go ahead and grab the object selection tool. And with the object selection tool, you actually have two different methods. You have a device method, so it processes it all on your device or a cloud method. Um, you can do either one. Cloud might give you deta more detailed results because it'll understand the subject a little bit better, but I'm going to stick with on device. And all I'm going to do is drag a selection around our tree. And you're going to notice immediately it's done a much better job right off the bat at selecting the entire tree and not 
some of the tree, right? So now I can pair this with a layer mask and we're getting there, right? At least we have most of the tree and most of the branches intact, but we obviously have, you know, a little bit of color bleeding and all sorts of things going on. So that's where one of my favorite tools in Photoshop comes into play, select and mask. So with any of the selection tools, you're gonna notice at the top on the options bar, we have our select and mask button right up here, right? And when I press that, this is gonna take that selection, apply the layer mask, or at least a view of it, right? So we have a few different views over here to the right within our properties. So we can do on black, on white, black and white, which is great for really seeing the detail. Uh, so if you're working with hair or fur, this is a wonderful view or on layers, right? But down here, you have all these different options to further refine that layer or that, that mask and selection. So if you increase the radius, right, it's gonna really adjust the size of that edge, uh, the refinement area. This works really well, especially with hair or fur, but it could work with branches as well. And then down here, you might wanna maybe shift the edge inwards a little bit. The tricky thing is, if you shift the edge too much, it's gonna start eliminating some of those branches. So you wanna find that balance there. And then increasing the contrast, we're gonna sharpen up those mid-tones, right? Which could help with branches. But I think for this particular example, down here at the bottom, decontaminate colors should work quite well. Aha, now we're getting somewhere. So what decontaminate colors did is it essentially looked around the edges and it looked for maybe light or color that might have been spilling from the original image. In this case, it was blue and gray from the sky. And then it kind of looked at the colors that we're working with on the inside that we want to keep. And it filled it in quite nicely. Then you can adjust the amount if you didn't want, you know, if it was too much, right? But I think somewhere around 100% looks qu quite nice. And then I just wanna, you know, tweak just a little bit can probably push this out just a touch. Radius, maybe on the lower side, possibly. I don't know, maybe on the lower side. Now you might notice somewhere like in this area here, especially with radius on, you might have a little bit of strangeness going on. So you might grab maybe your refinement brush and see if that helps a little bit, or your selection brush and just kind of paint some of that back. Oops, paint a little bit too much, right? Paint a little bit more of that back in. And of course you can spend hours tweaking some of this stuff if you really needed to, but we probably don't. So I'm gonna go back and just leave it as this for now. But we have a much, much cleaner selection. Again, you can tweak this to your heart's content, but I'm gonna go ahead and output this as a new layer with a layer mask so I can always dive back in if I needed to. But look at that, compared to what we had before, which was this broken tree with some weird stuff going on, this has given us a much cleaner selection. Now, obviously we have a problem, right? We have this nice looking dead tree with a great selection and layer mask, kind of floating in the middle of this lake, right? That's just not gonna work. So we wanna put this tree on something. So over back in Finder, I do have this that I licensed from Adobe Stock, but you may not have access to that, or you might want that, but something maybe a little bit more specific. So I do want to show you, if I hop over to Chrome, and I'm on Firefly, we're going to use the new Firefly Image Model 2 to generate something that we can put the tree on. So we might want something like maybe a mound, can never spell during a live stream, mound of dirt with moss and rocks maybe, and I'm gonna generate. Now by default, it's gonna give us a square aspect ratio, which we probably don't want for this particular example, but we're gonna let it do its thing and we're gonna see if we have to tweak anything else. And we also have a few different options for visual intensity, uh, photo settings, all sorts of things. So it's kind of understood what I want, but in terms of a photo composition, this probably isn't going to help. So the first thing I wanna do is I want to maybe expand this to landscape. That's the first thing, right? Second thing, visual intensity should be fine. Photo settings should be fine as well, but I kind of want this on more of a neutral background. So I might just put a comma here on a white background. 
And you can use words like isolated on a white background if this doesn't get you exactly what you want, but it should get us much closer. And let's see what happens. Um, okay, it's not too bad. Might want maybe like a, maybe instead of a mound, which is more like, we can also expand this to maybe widescreen possibly. Uh, what's another word for a mound, but also like longer? Maybe I can just long mound of dirt, I don't know. Could that work? Maybe, possibly. It's all about experimentation, especially when you're trying to generate new objects for your photo compositions. But let's see what happens. I, I'm sure there's another word and someone's gonna probably um, let me know in the chat, but these aren't bad, right? These can potentially work for our particular. Let's actually add the word isolate and see if it maybe allows us to see all of this at the same time. I know there's another word, but we're gonna run with it. Mound. Yeah. Maybe just like a area of, no, it's probably not the word I'm looking for. Anyways, we're gonna see what happens. Hopefully the music's running in the background so you don't have to just hear silence. But honestly, you know, this is pretty good, right? This is probably gonna get us kind of where we're looking to get it. It's not perfect, but I think it'll probably help quite a bit, right? So we might want something like this and we're gonna go ahead and download this or we could save it directly to our Creative Cloud libraries. But I'm gonna download this. It's applying content credentials, which is great. So we can tell that this has been AI generated. And if I hop over, you can also, yes. So someone's saying you can also use wide angle on composition settings, you can. So down here at the bottom, you can do wide angle. We'll generate one more. Also in the photo settings, you can choose wide angle as well. <laughs> We probably don't need much blur on this. So let's generate one more. Um, this should give us uh, much cleaner, wider results, but we'll see what happens. But anyways, we can download these images or save them to our Creative Cloud. Um, yeah, this, this, this one could work actually. Let's go ahead and grab this one. There is a little bit of blur in the background here, but that's totally fine. We can always deal with that later if we have to. So it's applying the content credentials, downloading the image. Let's hop over to Photoshop. I'm gonna grab that image and boop, pop it into place. And we'll leave it somewhere in this range here, right? Now, obviously we have this white background, right? So we can potentially remove background, which does a decent job if we are, you know, if we don't have a very complex subject, but let's try just because I like it a little bit better. Object selection, select and mask, right? Maybe we'll shift the edge a little bit because we do have a little bit of white still on there. Increase the radius a touch because we do have like dirt and moss and that sort of thing. Decontaminate colors. Sure, worked a little bit and then press OK. All right, let me get rid of that and get rid of that and move this down. So we're, we're kind of getting there, right? But obviously we have a few additional problems. You know, there's a little bit of a cutoff here from the original image, a little bit of a cutoff here. And also in general, these things are still floating in the middle of nothing. Nothing is really blending with the, the tree isn't blending with the dirt and the dirt isn't blending with the lake. And this is really where I think generative fill shines, allowing you to kind of do your thing when it comes to photo compositions and then let generative fill fill in the rest, no pun intended, but really kind of allow it to blend your work together. So let's start, let's start with the tree, right? So we might want this tree to blend in with this dirt. So I'm gonna make a selection somewhere around here. Some of these rocks might get destroyed, but that's fine, right? Now we could press generative fill and let Photoshop do its thing, but I might wanna guide Photoshop a little bit in the direction that I'm thinking, it kind of, it's in my head, right? So I might want something like tree roots with moss and press generate or the enter key on your keyboard, right? So right now it's hopefully gonna give us, it's generating and hopefully we're gonna see some tree roots that's blended in with this mound of moss and that's looking okay. There we go, right? Ooh, that's not bad. Almost has like a, this little hole in the middle. Maybe that's like a, entrance to this magical world, right? That's interesting, right? I do like this one. It just blends in perfectly. The new roots blend in with that tree. The tree roots blend in with that moss at the bottom. We're kind of getting there. 
But of course, we have this mound of moss that's just not blending with anything. A hobbit hole, yes. Or a badger den. It could generate a badger. Although, Firefly Image Model 1, which is currently in Photoshop, with animals... We'll try it. We will try. I promise we'll try it. But... All right. So, let's go ahead and make a selection around this area here. I'm pretty happy with this stuff down to the bottom, so I'm not going to select too much of it. So I've got this. And I want to make sure I'm on the top layer, right? So it's detecting everything below it. And this one, let's just let Photoshop do its thing and see what happens. It should detect that there's water down below and there's this mound of dirt and somehow it's going to blend these two things together. It may even give us a reflection, which sometimes is wild. Let's see what happens. Okay, it kind of blended it a little bit. That's not bad. That's decent, right? But of course you can dive in and make some changes. So if you wanted maybe like more tree roots, I don't know if this is gonna work, but in the water. Let's see what happens. And sometimes this is the fun part of generative fill is adding in some prompts and seeing what happens. It really kind of expands your creative mind and it might get to you, might get you where you want some, eh. Eh. Maybe just tree roots. Maybe the water is kind of throwing it off. How many legs would you like your badger to have? Select a number between 5 and 23, all we're saying. Hopefully we just get a badger with like... How many legs does a badger have to have? Two? Three? I don't know. Why did I th say three? Two or four? <laughs> Probably four, right? Um, this isn't bad. It's not terrible. But we do have our other options down at the bottom here. I think this is okay. It's not perfect, but I can definitely go in and, you know, make some additional changes if I need to. But let's, just for fun, just because we're all kind of on this badger thing, I'm going to make a selection here. Badger Den. I don't think this is going to give us anything that we want. It might be very bizarre, but let's see what happens. Let's have a little bit of fun. But, you know, in general, the photo composition is moving in the direction that we want. In general, Phil... General fill. Generative fill has certainly helped with that. I mean, okay. I don't hate it. And just imagine when Firefly Image Model 2 comes in to play. Let's let's just for fun. Let's go over A dead, I don't know if dead is gonna, it might flag it, but a dead tree with a badger den. Let's let's see something. Dead tree on a mound of moss with a badger den. Mars is saying the last one, Siamese badger. Last one wasn't too bad, but let's see what happens with Firefly Image Model 2. We should get more cohesive results, possibly. And again, once this finds its way into Photoshop, we see, I mean, it look, definitely looks more realistic, right? We've got this badger, we've got this den down at the bottom. It's not bad. Of course, it's not exactly what I want for my photo composition, which is really why we're making photo compositions, because we're kind of guiding it in exactly the direction we want, and then using Firefly and Generative Fill and Generative Expand to kind of push us in that direction. But you can see, you know, the badger at least looks a lot better. So, yeah, it'll get there. These are fun, but yeah, this, we'll stick with this one. Why not, right? All right, another thing I might want to do is I might want to add some leaves to this tree, but not necessarily leaves on the branches. I might want to have some leaves kind of floating around, maybe orange leaves or purple leaves or pink leaves or whatever it might be, right? Something fancy. Of course, we have got some green down here, but I think the leaves probably should be orange or something like that. Although we should probably change this to more of a... Should we change it to... See, this is what goes through your mind when you're doing these photo compositions, right? You might think, you know, there's all these green... Uh, the oranges and reds over here, and it's obviously fall. So we should probably change this to orange and red too, but then it might blend in too much. It might look weird. I guess we can try, right? So let's go ahead and group all this information. I'm going to select it all, Command and Control G, and this will be called Tree. 
And then down below, we've got our adjustment layers. I'm gonna go ahead and add, let's say, let's try hue and saturation. And I'm going to, actually, I'm not gonna clip it just yet because I wanna show you why I'm doing that. But down here, we can control the hue, right? So we can shift this, obviously. Now it's, right now it's some sort of trip, right? Obviously not what we want. We want to just affect the greens that are part of this tree. So if I switch this over to, let's say greens, I can now adjust the hue. But only a little bit is really happening, right? You can see down here, things are changing, but that's not exactly what we want. So the first thing we can try is clipping this adjustment layer to the group below it. So we can right click and then right click, there we go, uh, create clipping mask, or we can hold down our alter option key, hover in between the two layers and then click. So now when we kind of move that over, now it's it's on the all the colors, but if we go back to greens, it's only affecting some of the greens, but it's really looking for pure greens in this particular case, right? And you can see that down here at the bottom. So this is really what it's looking for. And then it's kind of blending this area here. And if we take a look at our actual moss, there are certainly some greens, but there's also some yellow going on, right? So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead down here and kind of bring this section over to the left, which is going to include some additional yellows. Now it's also gonna include some oranges. So we have to be careful with that balance, right? But now if I shift this over, we're gonna to start to see that it's adjusting our greens. And I can continue to tweak this a little bit so it blends a little bit more. Now, if you're gonna notice, if I grab the slider on the far left and drag that over, it's also starting to include some of the, this area down here, right? So I wanna find that nice balance, maybe right in this area here. Now, because I clipped it to the entire group, it's also affecting our mask of our, you know, the dirt and the reflection and all, all that stuff. So what I can do is with the layer mask that comes with our adjustment layer, I'm gonna simply grab a brush, maybe something nice and soft, make it nice and large. And with a black foreground color, whoops, I'm simply gonna just brush in this area, just so that our adjustment layer does not affect the reflection. And of course, anything else that you may not want affected, you can just paint in like that, right? But I think this could work. All right, I've never seen this trick before. Thank you, you're welcome. Hopefully when I do these sessions that uh, even if you know most of this stuff, if you pick up on one or two things, hopefully it was worth it. And it's free, so you know, it's it's a good time. Moss, oh, CJ. CJ is just like laying the facts on me. Moss doesn't generally change color in fall. Might need a color adjustment. Fine, you know what? I'm just kidding. We're gonna, you know what? This is a fun fantasy photo composition. Moss now changes color. We've got this weird badger thing going on. We're gonna run with it. I mean, we can do, we can do like different colors if we wanted to. We can do blue moss, right? Sort of. Ooh. Anyway, let's stick with that. All right, back to the leaves that I was talking about earlier. We might want some leaves, right? but not leaves on the tree. I want some leaves kind of floating around. So what I want to do for that is actually use a brush developed by my good friend and colleague, Ty T Kyle T. Webster. I can't talk. You can tell it's getting towards the end of the stream when I just can't talk anymore. So in my brushes, which you can access by pressing B and then going up to the brush picker at the top or just right clicking anywhere on the canvas, I do have a ton of different Kyle brushes already installed. Now, if you go to Google and you type in, actually, if you, there's another way you can do it. I think it's in here. Get more brushes. And this will bring you directly. I don't want that because that's a different browser, but it'll bring you to your browser. You can browse for more brushes or you can Google uh, Kyle T. Webster brushes and you can download them for free, which is great. But anyways, I do have in here, some leaves brushes. He has so many different packs that you can you can test out. But let me go ahead and choose that. I'm gonna make a new layer down at the bottom and I can brush. Now, this one's fine, right? But the nice thing about these brushes is that they're fully customizable. 
So what I'm gonna do is first, I'm gonna go ahead and hop into the window menu and then down to brush settings, there it is. And here we can control things like the spacing between the brushes. So I can space that out, right? And that's certainly helping. We can control the size. All right, not too bad. But I think where things are really gonna start to shine is under shape dynamics and then scattering. So you can control the angle of your brushes so that the leaves are kind of not all looking the same. Uh, roundness, if you wanted to, this one's not gonna do too much, a little bit, but not too much. Size jitter, so some of the leaves are bigger than others. And then scattering will allow you to really take those leaves and scatter them around, right? So I can scatter them like this, make sure both axes is turned on so they're kind of pushing in all sorts of different directions. Count if you want a lot of leaves or just a few leaves, right? And then I can start brushing and now we have these lovely leaves that are kind of floating around the tree. But right now they're all black. We might want some color involved here, right? So I can either grab the eye brush, I can hold down my alter option key and click on a color and then paint some additional leaves and that looks okay. But what if I wanted to have a little bit more color variation, right? So we do have in our brush settings, color dynamics and down here or up here, we can control the jitter between the foreground and the background color. Now, right now, the background color is white. So I can dive in here and maybe choose a different color, maybe a slightly darker color, possibly, right? So we've got these two colors, we've got this nice, maybe I'll change this actually. Maybe I'll bump this up a little bit more red, make it a bit brighter. And this one, I'm gonna make a little bit brighter as well, somewhere in this range here. And now we want to make sure that our foreground and background jitter is increased. And if we increase it to 100%, it's going to use both of those colors really nicely. We can also control hue jitter, saturation, brightness, purity, all sorts of fun things. But that will allow us to now brush. Ooh, look at that. Now we've got these nice leaves that are kind of floating around. We've got some nice red leaves, orange leaves, all sorts of different leaves. And we can either even increase our size of the brush Maybe I'll create a new layer, Command and Control, Shift and N. Maybe I'll have some leaves in the foreground. Now these leaves in the foreground, they're looking okay, but they're looking a little bit too artificial. Maybe that's the word, right? The ones in the background, you can't really see the details. So they work really well, but the ones in the foreground, they might also be out of focus a little bit. So what we can do is we can adjust that focus. So on this layer here, which I'm gonna name, I haven't been naming my layers, terrible. <laughs> Large leaves, right? I'm gonna convert this into a smart object and that'll allow me to preserve the data of these leaves so that if I need to go back later on, maybe I wanna make them smaller or larger, I can easily do that. So convert for smart filters, but this will also allow me to apply filters like Gaussian blur, and it's going to allow me to adjust those later on. Or you know what, maybe let's apply like a motion blur. Ooh. All right. Ooh, Clever is saying, and that's how you get fairies. It's an interesting point. So what we can also do, maybe not necessarily fairies, but we can use this to apply something like particles, right? So if I make another new layer, particles and let's just go for a regular brush very simple soft round brush right so if i were to obviously paint over top of this let's just do a white color we're gonna get this big brush line might be useful for something but if we go back to our brush settings we can create our own brush essentially right so i can increase the spacing size is okay for now maybe we'll drop it shape dynamics Size jitter, we definitely want some larger than others. Angle jitter, because it's round, it's not gonna make a difference. Everything's gonna look the same, but we can control the roundness jitter. So some of them are more you know, squished than others. I kind of like them round, but scattering, we definitely want, look at that. Count, we'll keep it one. Uh, if we wanted to apply texture, we can certainly do that. And we can, we have a bunch of different textures we can use, keep that off for now. But we can now kind of brush around and we've got this kind of interesting particle look. And then we can combine this 
if we hop into our layer styles, we can apply, let's say, an outer glow. Maybe we'll do color dodge, we'll bump this up. Opacity, size, something like that. Technique softer is okay. And obviously there's all sorts of different options that I can go into, um, you know, in another time. But as you can go through these different contours, you're noticing different effects on your particles, right? This one's a little bit harsher. Increase the jitter a little bit. Yeah, let's go for maybe, I mean, this one's not too bad. It kind of has, has this glow in the middle. If I drop the opacity a little bit, right? That's not bad. Another reason I love these streams is people like Clever give these clever ideas. My jokes are the worst. All right. Now, another way you can add some textures is by using images. So if I go over here, we've got textures, right? We've got all these different particle textures that are licensed from Adobe Stock. So I can grab maybe this one here, pop it into Photoshop. And then we can experiment with blend mode. So over here to the right within our layers, we can choose something like maybe screen, for example, or color dodge, which is gonna give us slightly different effects, but it's gonna leave us, it's gonna kind of knock the black background out of that photo and leave us just with our particles that so we can adjust the opacity. We can also apply maybe some mist or fog at the bottom. And essentially we can do the same thing. So we can go, whoops, we can go into our blend modes, change this over to something like screen or color dodge. Both will have different effects. Sometimes something like soft light could work, but when you have a very dark background, it's definitely gonna affect your layers behind us. You'll want to kind of knock out that smoke or fog in the foreground. But I think, ooh, lighten's not too bad actually. And if we want to, we can apply a layer mask, gradient, kind of rushing through this last section because we're almost out of time. Maybe drop the opacity a little bit. It's not too bad, I'm not loving it. But you can also apply, let's say maybe you want to apply, maybe you want like a more warm feel to this smoke, right? So you can apply, where is it? I know it's here, I know it, photo filter. So we can clip this and a warming filter, turn off preserve luminosity because we're dealing with like really light areas and see the difference, right? I mean, it's not too bad. It'll work maybe. There we go. All right. It's looking okay. It's not looking great. The one thing I want to show you is if you start applying textures that have color in them, then you can really start to give your overall images a nice, interesting feel. So if you choose something like soft light or color dodge, right? You're noticing even the background is kind of, the color is tweaking a little bit. So depending on if that's the direction you wanna go, a more magical look to your images, you can certainly do that. I think for this one, it might be a little bit overdone. If I did wanna shift the colors, we could do something like a gradient map, for example, right? So some maybe purples. So we can apply maybe a subtle purple gradient map and then experiment with our blend modes again. Overlay is interesting. I think soft light could be possibility. And then I can dive in here. Of course, you know, if you've got your highlights, your shadows and everything in between that you can adjust individually. But the last thing I want to show you, and this is kind of fun, is you can now use video for your textures. And you can, you can add video a long time ago in Photoshop, but for this particular example. Um, so maybe something like, you know, particles kind of floating around or more smoke or fog. So I'm going to drag the video directly into this document. And then under the window menu, you can go down to timeline, create a video timeline right here at the bottom. And here is your video, right? Now, when I initially play it back, it's, it's rendering each frame. So it's gonna be a little bit slow, but it works just like the photo. So I can go ahead and dive into the blend modes, change this to maybe screen, for example. And then look at that, we've got videos. So I can maybe hide the smoke down at the bottom, maybe hide these particles. You know what, let's add one more video. Why not, right? We're gonna break Photoshop. Same thing, changes to screen, play the video, which is gonna be a little bit slow because there's two videos, both rendering at the same time. But all of a sudden, 
we've added some motion. Now down here at the bottom, we'll have to extend these layers outwards so that they match with the video, but we now have motion in our photo composition, which is super cool. And it just adds incredible new life to your designs and your work. So that will wrap things up for me for today. A big thank you to everyone who has tuned in. Hopefully you picked up on some tips and trick tricks. Hopefully more than one trick. Um, definitely make sure to follow me on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, all those different places and stick around. We've got more content coming up in just a few moments and I will see you all next time. Thanks everyone.